Good morning. I'm Lloyd Duncan. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. The Lord be with you. The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this Easter Sunday morning. We are so glad that you are able to join us, whether online or in person, to celebrate the resurrection, the risen life of the risen Lord. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. Early in the morning light, the women went to Jesus' tomb. The tomb was empty. The stone rolled away. For God's love is stronger than death itself. Let us join our voices with Mary Magdalene. We have seen the Lord. Easter people, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us worship God together. The Apostle reminds us that the Spirit of God helps us, helps us in our weakness, knowing that we are unable even sometimes to pray. 
offering sighs that are too deep for words. So trusting in God's mercy and God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and our neighbor. O God, you raised Christ from the tomb and shattered the powers of sin and evil. Raise us from the tombs of our sin, O Lord, and bring us to new life in you. You bring us good news of Easter joy. Forgive us when we cannot hear it. You send us out to share your love. Forgive us when we cannot carry it. You cast a vision for peace and justice. Forgive us when we cannot imagine it. Forgive us when we stand in its way. For you are the God of the empty tomb, the one who makes all things new. Now hear our silent personal prayers of confession. Hear the good news of God's promise. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to you, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please join me for the prayer of illumination. Living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen word. Enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is Acts 10, verses 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one who ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives, for, receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen.
Easter. Did you get some nice Easter surprises this morning? For example, so, like something like this chocolate bunny? Have you gone on an Easter egg hunt? When I was a child, I loved finding my Easter basket and the eggs that had been hidden. Today, I have two eggs which I decorated. They are wooden eggs, so I can use them every year if I want to. But it makes me start wondering, what do eggs have to do with the real reason for Easter, the resurrection of Jesus? You know, we celebrate Easter because Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. And if that was the end of the story, we would not be celebrating Easter. But when the women went to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body, as was their custom, they discovered that the tremendously heavy stone that weighed, oh, probably a couple tons that covered his tomb was rolled away and he was not there. They were afraid that his body had been stolen and they were very upset. But then Jesus appeared to them. He had risen from the dead and was preparing to ascend into heaven. This is the reason we celebrate Easter. So what does the Easter egg have to do with that? The egg has long symbolized rebirth in ancient culture. When Christianity spread to these ancient cultures, the exchange of colored eggs became incorporated in the Easter celebration of Jesus' resurrection. The eggs were colored and given as tokens to remind Christians of the tomb and Jesus' triumphant entry over death. The egg represents the empty tomb of Jesus. Some people also say, that when the chicks peck their way out of the egg, it also symbolizes the resurrection of Jesus. So when you find your Easter egg, it might help you to remember that Jesus died for us and rose from the dead. Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gates of everlasting life, Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. Have a good week. Good morning, and I'm so excited to share your Youth Minute. Again, my name is Rebecca, and I am... Oh, jumping in. So we're looking at Mark chapter 16, and we're going to go to verse 6. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Y'all, this is just, this blows my mind sometimes, because we know Jesus, Son of God, partially the the part of God Trinity. He is God. He is man. He didn't need to roll away the tomb to get out of the cave. No way. The the stone was rolled away so that his followers could go in and see the place where he once was. It was rolled away so we could have undeniable proof because he understands it was hard. It was hard to believe for a moment for many but he loves us so much and he wanted to share this good news so thoroughly 
that he rolled away the stone so that the place where he once lay and was no more could be seen. Have a wonderful day. Our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. This is a very, very, very familiar passage of Scripture. We read from one of the four accounts of Jesus' resurrection every year. This time it comes to us from the gospel writer Mark. And Mark's account is very short and it ends very abruptly. Let's listen with fresh ears to hear the good news about the resurrection. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, for the past six weeks, and now for a seventh, we have been examining that ancient summary of our Christian faith known as the Apostles' Creed. It is our common, universal, baptismal creed. It's the faith into which we are all baptized. It's a concise statement of what Christians everywhere always have believed and confessed aloud. We began by reaffirming our belief in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, affirming that we have only one God and that this God is the one who made us and all that is. What we have been learning along the way is that each individual word and each particular phrase of this short confession of our core beliefs is drawn directly from the words of Scripture. Taken together, they range from the grand transcendence of God the Father and from heaven above all the way to the deep imminence of the line that we examined last week. So in a few short lines, we go from the maker of the heavens to the one who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. In just a few lines, our faith is stretched, if you will, from the heights, the very heights of heaven to the very depths of hell. Throughout this series, we have also been using the questions of the Heidelberg Catechism, drawing from that deep well of Reformation era churches and faith to focus our attention and guide our understanding of the ancient Apostles' Creed, to sort of stand in the line, if you will, of all of the Christians throughout history who have confessed this creed, to interpret our faith, to say what it means for us today, to say that we are Christian believers, that we believe. So today, when we ask the next question, what do we mean when we say, the third day He rose again from the dead? 
It should be obvious from ne- by now that we are not asking a theoretical or philosophical question. It's not a disinterested question. We're not asking a question of fact, not asking for a dry recital of history or objective scientific proof that he was in fact raised from the dead. But as the framers of the Heidelberg Catechism understood and recognized so well, this question is personal. The question is, how does Christ's resurrection benefit us? How does it benefit me that Christ was raised from the dead? And the catechism offers us a threefold answer. First, the catechism teaches us that Christ's resurrection benefits us because by His resurrection, He overcame death. Death did not get the last word. It didn't get the upper hand. You'll remember how we said last week that you can't disconnect the crucifixion and His death from the resurrection. The two have to be held together. You can't confess the one without also professing the other. They belong together. They work together. The resurrection makes that old saying we quoted from the Apostle Paul last week, true, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. That's why we can say, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, says the apostle, that the victory belongs to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's resurrection benefits us by overcoming death. But that isn't the whole of it. Notice how closely, even in that passage from the Apostle Paul, that sin and death are connected. And notice also how closely resurrection and righteousness are related. Christ's resurrection benefits us not only because by it Christ overcame death, but also by it He makes us to share in His own righteousness, the righteousness that He has obtained for us. In that same chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says it this way, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So when we confess publicly that we believe Christ rose again from the dead, we're not just saying that He conquered death, as important as that may be. We're also saying that He has taken away our sins. He has taken away my sins, and He has given us a gift of His own righteousness. In the letter to the Romans, which we studied in depth last summer, the apostle using the faith of Abraham and Sarah, as an example, says it this way. There wasn't any unbelief mixed in with Abraham's faith. He didn't waver concerning the promise that God had made, but he grew stronger and stronger in faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised to do. That's why the Scripture says that his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the apostle goes on, the words, it was counted to him for righteousness, that wasn't written for his sake alone. That was written for us, for our sake. So it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised him from the dead, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. How does the resurrection benefit us? Paul says, we benefit from the resurrection by the gift of justification that He gives to us. How does it benefit us? When we put our confidence and faith in the one who raised Jesus from the dead, when we profess and confess the faith that He rose again from the dead, then we are by faith the recipients of His righteousness. He was raised for our justification, to give us the righteousness that He enjoys and to justify us in front of the judgment throne of God. What do we mean when we say that on the third day He rose again from the dead? The second thing we mean 
is that we benefit from His resurrection by being raised to walk in a new life. If Christ has been raised, it means that by His power, by the power of His resurrection, we are also already being empowered to live a brand new kind of life. Again, we draw directly from the Scriptures, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We're reminded of what we celebrated already this morning, what we celebrate every time we come to the sacrament of baptism. All of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into His death. We were buried with Him in baptism in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also might be raised to walk in newness of life. When we confess that Jesus rose from the dead, we mean that He has destroyed sin and death to give us the righteousness that comes from God and a brand new way of living. Colossians chapter 3 says it this way, If then you have been raised with Christ, then seek those things that are above where Christ is. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is now hidden with God in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Put to death, the, the apostle says, therefore, all that is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, all of those things. You were walking that way, you were living that way at one point, but now because you have come to the faith, because you believe the resurrection, then you put them all away, anger and wrath and malice, slander, the obscene talk from your mouth. You don't lie to one another anymore, seeing that you have put off that old self with its practices and you have put on a brand new way of living. Ephesians chapter 2 says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. But God, being rich in His mercy because of the great love with which He loves us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and you've been raised up together with Him, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not the result of your working, so that nobody may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We've been given a brand new way of living. How does Christ's resurrection benefit me? Yes, it benefits me by defeating death and sin. It benefits me by giving me a share in His righteousness. But it also benefits me by raising me up with Him to walk in a whole new way of living. Third, and finally, the Catechism answers the question, how does Christ's resurrection benefit us? By pointing us to faith in God's ultimate final promise, the one that has yet to be fulfilled. When I say that I believe He rose again on the third day, I'm saying I believe that what God has promised, God will do. That God has promised to raise me to. Christ's resurrection is a sure pledge to us of our own blessed resurrection. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, the apostle says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your own mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You say, wait a minute. I thought you said we'd already been raised with him to walk in a whole brand new way of living. What do you mean? I will be raised with him. I thought I'd already been raised with him. I've been buried with him in baptism into his death and raised with him to walk a new life. That's what you said. So what's this, what's this rising again? What do you mean it's a pledge that we will also be raised? 
Last week, we talked about the fact that there is a universal human experience, the one that Christ has already experienced, but which we who are alive have not yet experienced, though we will. In that same chapter of 1 Corinthians where Paul is trying his best to explain the fullness of the meaning of the resurrection, Paul says, if in Christ we have hope for this life only, then we are of all people most to be pitied. Our faith stretches us hard to say something not only about the salvation that we have already received and already experienced through faith in this life, but also to say something about our hope for resurrection life. Our public profession of belief in the resurrection of Jesus bolsters that hope. Our faith says that the resurrection of Jesus benefits us as a secure pledge, as a promise that cannot be broken by God of our own resurrection from the dead. I will die. But my faith in the resurrection of Jesus says that I will also rise again. How does the resurrection of Jesus benefit us? It means, as Tish Harrison Warren says, that we can pull, put the full weight of our belief, our faith, on the promise that God has made to us. We can trust Him. It's a promise that when I close my eyes in sleep, when the darkness of death finally comes and catches up with me, that I too can rest in peace knowing that underneath it all, is the never-failing love of God. Because He rose again on the third day, I can close my eyes knowing that my eyes will open again to catch a glimpse, the glint of the sun rising in the east. In the end, as the apostle says, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. His resurrection means that I can put the full weight of my whole life on the promise that God loves me and that I will never be separated from that love. When the mystery finally gives way to understanding and the morning comes, when I no longer am looking through a glass darkly, but I can see Him face to face, then I will have proof of what I have right now as a pledge that nothing in heaven or on earth, can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. On that great and glorious day of resurrection, the light will prevail and the darkness will be defeated once and for all. On that great day of resurrection, life will prevail and death will be defeated once and for all. Because He lives, I know that everything will be set right. How does His resurrection benefit me? By defeating sin and death and giving me His righteousness and raising me to walk with Him in a brand new way of living right here, right now, and by giving me God's sure pledge that I too will be raised from death to life eternal. Amen.
Please join us in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son and our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat up on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to be judged the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The elder John says, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and yet refuses to help a sister or a brother in need? So remembering God's great love for the world, let's offer our lives to the Lord. Your offerings will now be received.
on that great getting up morning when all the faithful of all the ages are reunited in Christ. Scripture says that they will come from east and west, from north and south, to sit again at table with the Lord, in the banquet table of the Lord. Today we have come to renew our faith, to remember His death and to celebrate His resurrection, to receive just a foretaste of that sure and certain pledge of resurrection life. This is the Lord's table. It doesn't belong to First Presbyterian Church. It's not a Presbyterian table. Our Lord invites all of those who trust Him, who have put the full weight of their whole life and trust in Him to come and receive just a foretaste of life in His name. So let us give thanks and praise to the Lord. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord our God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O God. Your life is everlasting. Your faithfulness will never die. You have extended the promise of salvation to all through Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead. Therefore we praise you, joining the song of the universal church and the heavenly choir, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus Christ our Savior. Early on that first day of the week, Jesus' disciples went to his tomb only to find it empty. There they discovered that he had risen indeed. So now, we give thanks that on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear now our petitions. We pray to you, the Lord of endless life, for the church praying that you would help us to bear witness to this wonderful day, the good news of this day when Christ is risen from the dead. To tell everyone that His love and His life are extended to all who will receive it. We pray for the world. We pray again that you would destroy the shroud of death and destruction that is cast over the nations and the peoples of the earth, that you would spread out your feast of plenty and peace for all. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for John Arrington and Florence Bailey, for Don and Marita Beck, for Jay and Diane Bolan, for Sarah Brooks, for Melanie Cobb, for Bessie Costanza, for Ellen Dillon, for Vicki Duncan, for Nell Gracie, for Abigail Henson, for Ruby Jean McLeod, for Lou Metz, and for Art Schuler. Let your steadfast love surround and uphold all those who suffer. Hold them with your mighty and merciful hand and open up for them gates of healing and joy. 
by Your grace, O God, raise us from death to life. As You are eternal, show forth in us and in our world the good news of Your saving power and Your eternal love so that all may believe and receive life in You. Teach us to set our minds on the things that are above where Christ is seated at Your right hand and make us ready to meet Him when He is revealed in His glory. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Spirit, we bless You, God of glory, now and forever. Amen. And now, teach us again to pray the way that Jesus taught His disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you are celebrating the sacrament with us in your home, we invite you now to take bread and break it and share it. Give it to all who are participating saying, this is the body of Christ. And in the same way, take a cup with the drink, the wine, and dip the bread in the cup Share the sacrament in this way, saying the body and the blood of Christ, the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation. Let us pray. We thank You, O God, for giving us communion with our risen and glorious Lord. Now send us out to be a sign of the new life that has truly come into the world through Christ our Savior. Amen.
may the love of the Holy Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, abide with you forever. Alleluia. Now go forth in Jesus' name, remembering his new commandment, that we love one another just as he has loved us. Amen.
send us out to be a sign of the new life that has come into the world through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Oh. <laughs> As we are singing this last hymn, you are invited to come forward to sing uh, the Hallelujah Chorus. But please be making your way forward during the hymn so that there's not a dramatic pause at the end. I'm sure we'll be all on it.